There's always this one genre that most anime and manga fans tend to make fun of a lot. Harms. You know how these type of stories go. One male MC surrounded by multiple girls engaging in romantic hijinks and fan service. Oh yeah, and plot. Love it, hate it, harms can be divisive stories that may get tedious. As more and more new stories are being made, we almost get the same beats and similar character archetypes. However, there is one series in particular that does repeat having these types of characters, but they rather serve as an embodiment of these past harm archetypes, as well as reconstructing them to become more interesting characters in contrast. I am talking about Data Live is a series written by Koshi Tachibana, which was adapted into an anime in 2013, with three seasons completed by the time of this recording, and still ongoing. The story features Shido Itsuka and his encounters with the spirits, powerful girls with the potential to devastate the world. In order to stop them from being a hazard level threat, Shido is tasked to seal their powers. How? By making them fall in love with him and sealing their powers through a kiss. Yeah, yeah, I know, but hear me out. What I have to applaud for Data Live is that it embraces the stereotypes of a harm show, but it's able to serve as a reconstruction to the familiar tropes. To describe reconstruction, let's first talk about deconstruction. Deconstruction is where the audience is given a set of tropes, conventions, and the typical premise, and breaks apart any hidden truths and consequences. One major example of deconstruction in the harm anime genre would be School Days, where it had the main cast emotionally fall apart. However, reconstruction is the opposite of deconstruction. A reconstruction acknowledges the flaws and assumptions of a trope that has undergone deconstruction, so it either modifies the trope in a way that resembles the original and still work in reality, or find a solution for the trope to become useful again. After rewatching the anime and even reading the novels, I was able to understand the genius of Data Live. Although the series does fall into the general tropes and stereotypes of the genre, I believe Data Live was able to reconstruct and even involve itself into a special story. The series acknowledges itself really apparent that it's not easy to have people fall in love with the other, yet stake is at hand. Most of the characters in Data Live were able to catch a long lasting impression on me because of their design, personality, and the archetype they embody. Although yes, some of the typical harm tropes are still around like classic fan service, yet I can still argue that it's mostly tame and doesn't really interrupt the pacing of the story. Not all of the girls are shafted or hanging around in the background. It's not just romancing the next girl and the next, Shido has to make sure all of the girls' powers are sealed so we get a good reason why they stick around. I also had to mention, the production for this series is amazing! Although each season have a different animation studio, even the team that work on this series knew that this anime is more deeper than any harm series. The majority of the fights and action scenes are incredible. Toka and Origami's fight from episode 1 is still impressive, even upon rewatch. But the major highlight of this production is the soundtrack. The main composer of the series is Go Sakabe, and every piece he has arranged from anime to tokusatsu is a masterpiece. Now, let's move forward with the characters in each storyline. I'm only going to be talking about what was already adapted into the anime, from season 1 through season 3. Light novels spoilers past those will be avoided for this video. <sighs> Shido Itsuka is our main character with a strange power that allows him to seal the powers of a spirit through a kiss, and our generic protagonist. When we were introduced to Shido, he was a pushover and unassertive. But all this changes when he takes the risk of going outside during a spatal quake believing that his sister Katori was in danger, and this is where he first meets Toka. When he was later recruited into Rad Taskir and assigned to seal Toka, He's not doing it because with great power comes with great responsibility, but rather, he doesn't want to see her sad anymore. Shido would have fallen into the pitfalls of a generic harm protagonist as a passive and useless character who was dragged along by the plot. But no. Over the course of the series, in a pursuit of desire, he takes action in direct conflict with the people in the world around him. In this case, Shido has the desire to protect the spirits out of sympathy and becomes an active character. You know, when I rewatched this series, I noticed how Shido is not really much of a punching bag. Like sure, there are moments where he gets caught into compromising situations, but he rarely gets smacked around like he's a pervert. For a guy with a harm composed of abnormally powerful girls, 
He is one of the few protagonists who gets smacked around less daily since the girls are more affectionate to him. What I also do like about him is that even after he gained the powers of the sealed spirits, he doesn't have a goal to become an all-powerful badass after obtaining these powers. I know these powers gives him some advantages like healing and summoning Sandalphone, but I have to applaud the series for not having Shido overuse these abilities and only using these gifts in high dire situations. Over the course of the series, he has to face more and more difficult spirits and opponents that drove him to make nearly impossible choices. Shido has been shown to be more determined and persistent over the course of the series to make sure every spirit find their true happiness, even as far as to be contributing to some of the action scenes. He doesn't have a low IQ, he's not useless, and doesn't make cringing decisions. Shido is definitely, by far, one of the best harm protagonists and probably is my favorite MC of the genre. A generic harm protagonist done right, even if he is considered as one. Shido's story was never about becoming the most powerful person in the universe, but rather, he's just a boy who wants to do the right thing and how these moral choices impact the world around him. Shido might not be the strongest or the most intelligent, but in terms of bravery and heroism, he's unparalleled. To begin with the first story, Shido first meets a spirit clad in violet, who is referred as Princess. The spirit was cold and hostile, even drawing her sword out of suspicion towards the boy, before disappearing when the anti-spirit team arrived to exterminate her. A week later, Shido reunites with the spirit and convinces her that he isn't there to kill her. Although nameless at first, Shido decided to call her Toka after the 10th of April, the day the two met. It's during their first date where Toka's true and naive childlike personality comes to show. Soon raise our characters with an aggressive personality, before gradually showing their sweeter side. This can also go the other way around. I personally don't have the problem with the Sundarai trope, but if I have to be honest, the violent Sundarai where they physically and emotionally attack the MC is not really my thing. It's not cute, it borderlines to a toxic relationship. Modern harm stories tend to have the main girl possess a Sundarai personality. I have to give the series points with Toka who starts off incredibly hostile in the first episode, then a tsundere in the second, and finally reveal her true, bubbly, and sweet personality in the third episode. And yeah, she does sometimes revert back to being hostile in some later parts of the show, but always comes back as that hyper-energetic and cheerful girl, which I have to consider is a really stronger personality compared to other female harem leads. Toka has virtually no childhood, and hasn't had a true experience with life before meeting Shido who showed her the beauty of the world. At a moment where he looked like he was gone forever, even after convincing her that he won't leave her and believing that the world has finally rejected her, fate won't end the story just yet. This here is an amazing scene, and honestly one epic kiss scene. The opening theme song placed here intensifies the stakes of the situation and perfectly fits Shiro's determination to save the princess. These three episodes with Toka Yatagami are by far an excellent start to the series. <laughs> Yoshino is the second spirit that Shiro encounters, and she's a shy and innocent little girl who can easily be dealt with compared to the other spirits. However, one memorable moment that I do find interesting about her character is her split personality that she conveys through her hand puppet, Yoshinon. Almost similar to Toka, Yoshino's story in this arc is about opening up to new friends, as Yoshinon was the only friend she had before meeting Shido, while in her case, mustering up the courage to do so. <laughs> Kurumi Tokisaki is by far the most creepy and disturbing character in Data Live. Yet, she remains an audience fan favorite, myself included. A transfer student at Shido's school, while he tried to get answers from her after revealing to their class that she's a spirit, she ends up trying to seduce him instead. 
Although something is clearly suspicious with her, it is later revealed that she is responsible for the deaths of countless lives, also referred as the worst spirit. The story has reached a point where moral dilemmas is playing out, but what makes me and audiences find endearing about her character is how much she subverts expectations in this arc. She is willing to kill countless people, including herself, for her own personal agenda, which is incredibly difficult for Shido to get through to her. I really love everything about her, the design of her asshole dress, weapons and abilities, her flirtatious and psychotic personality, Kurumi is a complete guilty pleasure. Okay, that was a lie. She's my favorite data live waifu because of that lingerie shopping scene. Kurumi is the first girl Shido failed to save, which I do applaud the series for having committed for so long. Oka and Yoshino appear to be a piece of cake, but not Kurumi, and it would build up to even more difficult spirits that are hard to even convince to seal. She does return in some story arcs to occasionally aid Shido, but sadly she hasn't played a completely major role. It'll have to take a potential 5th anime season for a full-on Kurumi storyline, and trust me, it'll be worth it. And I also had to recommend getting into Data Bullet, a spin-off of the Data Live series that has Kurumi as the main character. You can find translations of the light novels online, or even watch the two-parted animated movie. <laughs> Katori Itsuka falls into the little sister stereotype. <coughs> Alabama. Well, actually, she's Shido's adopted sister. I admit, when she was introduced in episode 1, she was portrayed as an overly adorable little girl who dotes on her older brother and wow, who wouldn't have cringed from that? Thankfully, it was subverted when it turns out she's actually a hardcore military commander behind her brother's back, which I have to admit is really funny. But like I said with Toka, I'm not a fan with the violent tsundere. So she's an okay character who I really can't rank high. But what I did not expect was her character actually being a spirit. One of the most memorable scenes with Kotori is her fight with Kurumi, and her astral dress has a gorgeous design. Her weapon is massive yet insane, and that smile is frightening. She was no longer herself and it was quite an intense moment in the battlefield. Also, Shido's healing power is explained as Katori is a spirit with the ability to heal from her injuries, and was the first spirit he sealed which was another interesting twist. What I did like about Katori's storyline is how much secrets are open upon Shido's character, and the start of unraveling more hidden secrets for the overarching story. Oh, and I know this is Katori's section, but I feel I should mention Mana Takamiya, Shido's biological sister. There isn't much to say about her outside her rivalry towards Katori in regards of being Shido's true sister, her being a spirit killer hunting down Kurumi, and also I don't want to reach light novel spoilers. But I'll say this, at least the series tries to have a pure and normal sister character with Shido's actual blood sibling, which is kind of refreshing. Hmm. <laughs> Progressing into Season 2, we are introduced to Kaguya and Yuzuru, two spirits who were originally one spirit known as Yamai. It's easy to quickly tell the two apart. Kaguya has a delicate figure and an outgoing personality, while Yuzuru has a curvy figure and speaks in a robotic third-person tone. While the characters were on a class trip, they meet the twins fighting against each other for the sole purpose of deciding who is the true Yamai, and end up choosing to sell a challenge by seeing who could seduce Shido first. As the story progresses, it's revealed that despite being opposing forces, both Yumais are actually fond of the other, even willing to sacrifice themselves so the other can live. Shido, being determined as always, was able to quickly figure out a solution by sealing their powers at the same time so both can coexist. The reason why I like this arc is because it represents that life shouldn't be taken up for granted, and especially the bond made with that other person. Miku Izuyoi is a character that we can love to hate at first. She is a lesbian pop idol who cared about herself, hates humanity and men in particular, and objectifies girls like they're her slaves. Miku is honestly another difficult spirit for Shiro to even deal with because of her behavior alone. And it also reaches a point to the story where Shiro cross-dresses in order to get closer to Miku. <laughs> what? <laughs> Okay, never mind. Shiori is the best girl. Also, when Miku finds out Shiori is a guy, it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. 
まさかか確認してくださいあなたバックアップ how Miku being a difficult spirit to deal with Tragic past and all, Miku is painted as a terrible person, and although this sounds like a criticism against her character, I honestly see this as the series painting her intentionally unsympathetic, but her role was important to grow Shido's character. Even Shido had no damn with her deal during when they stormed DEM together, but despite this, Shido was able to get through to Miku and protected her from Toka in her inverse form. In the end, she was finally able to open up to her darling. Overall, for season 2, it is an amazing season. More great action, a wonderful new cast of characters, and the story progresses to even new more mysteries. It has reached a point where our generic protagonist makes himself more useful by taking part in the battlefield. Now that's a real man. Okay, if I have to be honest, I'm not a fan of the first stretch of this arc, but the latter stretch is forgivable. When I first watched season 3, I was invested with the idea of the older sister archetype. But no, it turns out she's just a little brat. Natsumi is a shift shaping spirit who mistakenly believes Shido found out her secret, so she tried to ruin his life and then turn everyone into children. Is this supposed to be funny? It isn't. This is a small nitpick for me, but why did Natsumi have to actually be a little girl? Inappropriate implications and all, why didn't they keep the older sister like archetype? Here we get childish hijinks out of petty reasons because she thinks that he knows that she's a kid, when it's just a dumb misunderstanding. I get that she has a tragic past in the light novels, but I'm judging this story solely before her actual past was explored. But let me at least give this storyline some praise since I did like the latter half of this arc. In the previous arc, Miku appeared to be a lost cause, but was able to redeem herself in the end. However, the theme of Natsumi's arc is mercy and forgiveness, which wasn't explored in the previous story, but here, this theme is better fleshed out. Although Natsumi acted as a brat for this story, the main cast was willing to forgive her and show kindness, not out of caution, but out of compassion and sympathy. They all have to praise her since she has been facing through self esteem issues. But let's talk about this season overall. What happened with season 3? This is not regarding the stories being adapted, but the animation is not good. Each season of Data Live often changes animation studios. Although season 2 had amazing animation, the last studio sadly went bankrupt after that season ended. The studio in charge of season 3 is JC's staff. Wait, what? How is that possible? They've done better work. It feels like JC staff thinks Data Live is just another generic harm show to the point where they barely gave the animation any effort. The animation does get stiff and wonky at times. But you know what's worse? They crammed the Itsuka disaster arc into one episode. Why? At least the writing and the music still remain consistent. But please, tell me there's one saving grace with this season. Wow, I can't believe we reached this far without mentioning her. The final character that we'll talk about is the Harum Beta, Origami Tobichi. Top student in her class, she is one of the suitors chasing after Shido who works for the AST to eliminate the spirits. And she's also one of the most forward female characters in this series. I mean, like, wow. <laughs> It's kind of funny upon rewatch. I confess, I did not like her character when I first viewed the series. It's just that because her parents were killed by a spirit does not justify this cold, heartless attitude, especially towards Toka and Katori. It just makes her an equally dangerous threat comparing to the other spirits. I was able to tolerate her in season 2, mainly because her role was somewhat minimal, although it does set up a small plot thread of her wanting to get stronger, which does unfold here in the third season. Origami, despite growing used to the spirits living a normal life, reverts back to her spirit hunting persona once more, and aligns with DEM. Even if the spirits that Shiro sealed weren't involved with her parents' death, 
she's only killing them as if she's killing the one who killed her parents. This lust for revenge and her unable to get over her hatred is why she couldn't stand a chance in a 1 against 4 battle. But then... Returning to the battle in a white astral dress, Origami herself has been transformed into a spirit, and to destroy the things that she hates the most, well, she became that very monster. With this newfound power, she decides to use it to finally kill the spirit who murdered her parents. How? Well, Origami goes back in time thanks to Kurumi and tries to fight the suspect in the vicinity. However... Returning to the present, Origami inversed and was unable to be saved no matter what. Shido does figure out the truth and changes time to create a timeline where Origami can be happy. Although he succeeded, what could not change is that no matter what, it could not take away Origami's painful memories of causing her parents' death. But Shido gets through to her and reaffirms his promise to hold on to her burdens. After rewatching this series, I was able to find appreciation for Origami's character, which has been built up to this moment. At first, she made me feel infuriated with every terrible action she made, and finally faces the consequences that she rightfully deserved. The chain of revenge can take a toll to the point of making hypocritical choices and hurt those close to them. It took three seasons to reach the climax of Origami's recurring character arc that has culminated into making me finally enjoy her character. And yes, this arc does involve time travel, which might annoy some people, but in my opinion, it's still decent for a time travel story. But it does explore more into Kurumi's time manipulation abilities, and also more into the events of Katori becoming a spirit. It further delves into the mystery of Phantom, explains how Origami knew Shido back at the start, and reveals that Kurumi was conveniently around that time. Hmm. Long hair Origami is the most pure thing in this series. She refolded back into the old timeline version in the end, but as someone who read the novels and without spoiling, rest be assured that long hair Origami won't be gone yet. Data Life is an underappreciated harem, but I do understand why people could be turned off by the series. It just looks like another typical harem anime, but I still argue that it is capable of reconstructing a story with these tropes. But most importantly, I feel this series was able to dive into the complex personalities with these character archetypes. I'll still praise Data Live for that, as well as their majestic soundtrack, and I still think the anime should stick to one studio. If I had to be honest, I did not realize that the plot threads left over would set up something big. What is the deal with Isaac Westcott and DEM Industries? How did Shido get the ability to seal the spirits? Are all the spirits used to be human? What are Kurumi's goals? What are Phantom's goals? Is Shido doing the right thing by sealing the spirit's powers? The story will slowly begin to get more darker and more serious with the anime's fourth season and beyond, which will hopefully reveal twists and surprises that many will not expect. This series definitely deserves more appreciation. Data Live might not be a great anime, but it is a great horror anime, and will be my favorite series from the genre. What are your own thoughts with the series? Feel free to comment down below, and thank you for watching this video. I'll see you guys next time.